So let's talk about the history a little bit. And Liana, you have a, probably a better understanding of this than, than anyone because MAPS has been involved in the early stages of psychedelics. Can you tell us a little bit about the history and the evolution of this category? Sure, and how yeah, it's changed? And I work with MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. MAPS is a 36-year-old nonprofit that's been pioneering the research into the beneficial uses of psychedelics. We've done initial research into most of the psychedelics that you can think of and are currently in phase three. We just finished enrollment for our second of two phase three trials for MDMA-assisted therapy to treat PTSD. In about 2015, when we realized that we could market MDMA as a pharmaceutical product, we started the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. Um, and if all goes well and if we get approval, it'll be the first uh, company on the planet to have a psychedelic assisted therapy protocol approved by any regulatory agency anywhere on the planet. Um, we're also doing research in Israel and Canada uh, at the same, that are both in phase three, and we're about to open research in seven countries across Europe and other places around the world. I've been involved with MAPS since 2010. Um, I did a five-year detour into the cannabis industry where I worked for the largest investor network at the time, um, and then I came back into psychedelics. And in 2010, it was completely taboo to get up on a stage in front of people and speak about this topic out loud. So we've just seen a dramatic shift, and the main reason that that has changed is because of the strength of the research, which was mentioned just earlier. Um, the history, there's a really robust history of research into psychedelics in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, it got out of the lab, we all know the story, um, but there was always a, a huge signal and a huge desire to investigate these, these uh, molecules because they're so interesting and there's more that we don't know about them than, than that we do know about them. And now, just in the past few years, really when MAPS got permission from FDA to move from phase two to phase three, we saw this huge explosion of new companies starting and, um, and new research getting initiated. So at this point now, we're in um, what some call the third wave or the second psychedelic renaissance, and it, it looks and feels entirely different because we have such incredibly robust and strong, and strong science backing us up. Mm. Um, I'll also mention that MDMA wasn't made illegal until 1985. Uh, all the other classic psychedelics were made illegal in the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. And so there was a 15 year window where therapists were using MDMA in their practice. So we have a huge body of, of information. And when Rick Doblin started MAPS in 80, 85, 86, he, went, he came in knowing that MDMA was very effective for the treatment of trauma due to all of this anecdotal experience with thousands of uh, people being treated in therapy sessions. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, um, I I'd like to add to that uh, excellent uh, history, but psychedelics are some of the most interesting uh, molecules on the planet. They have been around for thousands of years. We have evidence in cave paintings of both human beings and animals ingesting these drugs. We know through history, they're mentioned in the Bible, they're used throughout the Bible. Uh, fast forward to uh, Middle Ages, they've been used, and look at uh, Native Americans have been using these molecules for um, healing purposes and spiritual purposes for many, many years. I'll just, the ancient Greeks as well, there's a great book called The Immortality Key, which elucidates how the ancient Greeks um, likely also use psychedelics. Aristotle, Plato, all of them, yeah. So one of the first um, moments, I think, that where this class has been legitimatized is when it was being studied with veterans, actually, in post-traumatic stress disorder. Do you, Saad, do you want to talk a little bit about that and, um, you know, what happened with, with those studies and from the veteran? from the veteran perspective? Yeah, no, I mean, look, the, you know, this is, you've got uh, an incredible push by the Veterans Affairs and given, I mean, people don't really realize this, but there are more deaths in the armed forces through suicide than there are in combat. And that rate is double for women in the armed forces, right? And so a lot of funding has come from the likes of DARPA. A lot of funding has come from the likes of, you know, the US Department of Defense. Um, and it's both to find a way to, um, you know, treat veterans, of course, but also how can we actually um, reduce the level of PTSD uh, for uh, at the time when they're in battle, right? Um, and there's a, you know, a, a, a great anecdote and, and stories with regards to ketamine. If you administer ketamine on the battlefield to soldiers that's gone through a traumatic event, um, because of the ketamine, uh, they're... Um, perception of that particular traumatic event is, is significantly reduced. So a lot of funding has been put in there, and that sort of a backing 
um, has been has been very important to the psychedelic renaissance movement mm -hmm. because regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, whether you're Republican or Democrat in this country, I mean, outside of the U.S., it's, it's also huge, but in this country, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, um, it's a very important initiative. And so not only is there political will behind it, there's mm -hmm. funding behind it, and that research that the funding has uh, you know, uh, generated has been very, very important to, to getting us to where we are today.